Well, hello, I'm Martin Green from UNSW Sydney. We're all aware how the price of solar photovoltaics has dropped very rapidly over recent years. And now in fact, it provides the cheapest form of electricity in most countries of the world, according to the International Energy Agency. But there is a potential for even much lower costs in the future. So today I'd just like to address the topic of how cheap can solar photovoltaics become. So there's two ways of doing this. One is a top-down approach um, where you look at uh, what's happened in the past. And this is a chart that was published a couple of years ago, just showing the uh, accumulated information about how the costs have changed uh, over time, as well as the prices. And um, a huge amount of information collected here, a logarithmic uh, plot of the prices and a linear plot of the time. And, um, you know, if you look at that, you can fit a lot of the curve with the straight line there. And that corresponds to a 7% per year accumulated reduction in the cost of the cells. So this can be regarded as a generalized form of Moore's law. So Moore's law is very famous in microelectronics. So the number of transistors on a chip doubles every year or every two years. Um, and this is something similar. The price of PV historically was reducing about 7% a year up to about uh, 2000, 2005. So for over 20, 25 years, uh, it was following this trend. So uh, what you can do and what we did do um, was extrapolate that into the future. And we used to say, wow, in 2020, at this type of cost reduction, we'll hit the magic $1 a watt. And that's where photovoltaics will really start taking off. But what's actually happened is that um, we're already at 20 cents a watt in uh, 2020. So uh, we've broken away from that historic trend. So more than more has been the cost reduction in photovoltaics. Now, the reason for this is due to um, one of my former PhD students, Dr. Zhengrong Shi, shown here. And behind him there is just a plot of how quickly the price has dropped since 2008. This is the selling price of a solar module. So certainly more than more, dropped very precipitously beyond 2008. And that was largely due to uh, Dr. Shi. Uh, so what he did, he wanted to start manufacturing in China, which wasn't as promising as it sounded back then because there was just no infrastructure in China for doing that back at the turn of the century. But he was successful in doing that with help from some other members from my uh, team and former members. And uh, the other thing that he did that was very important was he managed to raise a huge amount of capital by listing on the New York Stock Exchange. In fact, he was the first private company to list on this exchange and the listing was a huge success. So this is the day of the listing in December 2005. I was fortunate enough to be up there on the stand helping him to ring the bell. Uh, but it was a huge success raising over $400 million, as well as making the um, US investment banks that had encouraged him in this venture uh, very rich as well. Um, so that opened the floodgates. And uh, within a year, the next uh, two companies had listed, Trina and Canadian Solar. They weren't nearly so as sophisticated and they were only assembling cells into modules at that stage, but this listing pumped a huge amount of capital in the company and they have grown to be some of the world's major manufacturers. And then followed by other companies. The people in circles are people from my, my team. So we were very heavily involved with this. So you're getting an insider story here about what went on. But this, um, huge injection into the manufacturing industry of, of cash from US investors is responsible largely for those uh, that massive cost reduction shown there. So this chart here just shows the timing of uh, cash injections, but over 7 billion US dollars were pumped into these operations in China over a very short period. The global financial crisis in 2008 put an end to it, but that was um, sufficient time to allow some of these then small companies to very quickly grow into major manufacturers. There was a second big drop slightly afterwards, a bit of a pause then a second drop. And that's when a lot of Chinese state owned companies who didn't need to um, worry about uh, the US stock market to raise capital, they've had uh, access to huge amounts of capital, they decided to get involved, but 
they were largely unsuccessful. A huge amount of money was wasted on this second burst of activity, but it uh, did push the prices down further. So you'll see there, we got to a dollar a watt in 2012 rather than 2020. So a huge acceleration of Moore's law, <laughs> the version for photovoltaics anyhow. If we look at that shaded region there, that's the more recent region, and, and we've been uh, in, in another period where Moore's Law applies, a new version of it. But um, if you plot the um, average selling price of modules over this period, you'll see that they've also been reducing at a steady rate on this semi-logarithmic graph, corresponding to about 20 to 26% per year learning. So a new period of uh, very active uh, cost reduction. So we get a generalized a different version of Moore's law for, applicable to photovoltaics. But over this recent period, the price has been halving every three years. So a photovoltaics merge, version of the Moore's law. And uh, I'm expecting that to continue for the next three years for reasons that I'll outline. So we, we're expecting to see this um, trend continue for at least another three years, this halving in price. Uh, just by way um, of for further use, um, this, this year, some uh, PERC modules, you know, one of the reasons that prices have been coming down rapidly, as I explained, is the introduction of PERC solar cell technology onto the market. And those modules have been selling for 17 cents a watt. So at 200 watts a square meter, which is the type of power output they're able to give, you, uh, you works out the selling price of modules is about $34 a square meter, which is really very cheap when you consider the cost of floor coverings and things like that. But a little bit more about PERC. PERC is a structure that was developed by my group back in the 1980s and 90s, but um, it stands for passivated emitter and rear cell. So the emitter is just the top of the cell and the rear is the back of the cell. So we found out ways of fixing up both the top and the back of the cell and a structure that uh, allowed the corresponding efficiency improvements to be realized. So this is the team that um, uh, was responsible for developing the PERC cell, which I personally uh, had invented in 1983. Um, but uh, many of those people have gone on to play a mu major role within the industry, uh, becoming uh, captains of the industry for various of the various manufacturers that I mentioned before. The chart on the right just shows the uptake of PERC over recent years. So the dark blue region shows the previous incumbent technology which was a back surface field approach that was developed in the 1970s. But over the last five years, the PERC, which is the gray and the yellow regions and a bit of the black region has taken over the market. And this year, 86% of production worldwide is our PERC technology. So um, PERC not only reduces cost by improving the performance of the solar panels, it's also introduces new functionality that wasn't cheap to introduce prior to the PERC um, development. But um, one thing it uh, allows is bifacial cells, cells that respond to light from both directions. And by um, incorporating this into cells, you can increase the power output by somewhere between five and 20%, depending on how much care you take with that. The other thing that happened at the same time, and um, PERC is uh, very suitable for this, is, to, uh, is the cutting of cells in half. So um, that, as we'll see, has allowed a progression to much larger wafers um, because they, um, the solar cells develop a huge amount of current. And if you make them too big, they'll just generate too much current than you, then you can easily transport around. So having, cutting them in half reduces their current and um, makes them more viable to, um, to, to make large panels using them. The other big approach has been uh, shingling which has been uh, a way of packing the cells more densely in the module or tiling is a more general version of that. This just shows the, um, uh, well, you can see the module on the right is using half cut cells. They're rectangular rather than square. But on the left, you can see the um, a result of being able to cut the cells in half is you can use much bigger wafers. So the industry is now very switching, very rapidly switching from the, uh, 156 millimeter square wafers, which have been the mainstream for the last eight years or more, uh, to much larger 210 millimeter wafers, which is the largest you can cut from a, a, you know, the largest ingots that are grown in any volume commercially. 
Um, so that is really um, reducing the cost of photovoltaics. And uh, also what's happening at the same time is the modules are getting bigger because the wafers are getting bigger, the modules are getting bigger and you can see the size of a, of a typical um, modern module over there getting over uh, two square meters, well over two square meters. So some of them now are approaching three square meters in uh, area. So the size of the module is growing, becoming quite big. Well, get back to the theme, how, you know, how low in cost they can become. Um, another way of looking at that is what's called the learning curve. So again, you plot the logarithm of the cost or price versus not this time a timeline, but the uh, accumulated volume that has been produced. This is known as um, uh, Wright's law in that most uh, commodities or products follow uh, a linear uh, variance when plotted on a graph like this. And uh, that, that's due to the learning. As you produce more of something, it becomes cheaper. Um, so for photovoltaics, um, uh, that type of law uh, was first mentioned back in the 1970s. But if we had believed the um, predictions of that law back then, you know, at the end of last year, we had 600 gigawatts of photovoltaics installed worldwide. And if you just extrapolate that variance uh, to to that period, you end up with a price that when converted to dollars of the day, works out at about 20 cents a watt, which is exactly what modules were selling for. So back in 1972, if you had believed Wright's law, you could have actually predicted that price. Things are a little bit more subtle in that and shown by this graph by the CITI group, but um, on the left is just shown, you know, just fitting a, a, a straight line to the variance as is normally done on the left-hand side. And uh, this is using data up to 2011, but it predicted a 2020 price of 53 cents. But if you do a more subtle interpretation of the learning, in this case, dividing it into three regimes, you know, like a pre-industrial, you know, scaling up to full-scale manufacturing in the second regime, and then into full-scale manufacturing in the third regime, you get different learning rates for each phase of the industry. And now, um, you know, projecting from 2011 with this new learning rate, you end up with 20 cents, which is pretty much where we are, or 25 cents to be precise, um, pretty much where we were at, um, where we are now in 2020. So um, uh, we're actually learning very quickly. The industry is in a 40% learning rate regime at the moment, as shown here. So, that, you know, so that's a top down approach. So, you know, things are going to get cheaper and uh, there's no sign of either of those laws showing any decrease in the rate of um, cost reduction. Another way of looking at it is go from the bottom up. And that's what I've tried to do here. These are figures from NREL, just looking at the cost of some of the basic components that are used in the module, like the aluminium frame and the glass cover sheet and the plastic encapsulants that are used to encapsulate the cell. And even without counting the solar cells, they total up to you know close to 17 US dollars a square meter. I mentioned before the total selling price of the modules was 34. So this is half the selling prices in some of these basic materials. So you might say, well, there's a fairly natural barrier, you know, aluminium and glass have been produced in enormous volumes. So not much potential for uh, further cost reductions with those. But if you look back on um, NREL figures as a function of time, you'll find that even these commodities, uh, the price has been reducing very quickly. So glass, um, just plotting data that's been published by NREL over the last eight years from periodic examinations of manufacturing costs, you find it's been reducing at 18% a year. The plastic back sheets, the polymeric back sheets by 16% and some of the other layers used in the module by a similar amount. Combined with the uh, increasing efficiency of the panels, that means the cost of these basic components is also reducing, you know, at something like 20% a year as well. So we got the whole cross section. So even going through a, a bottom up approach, you know, we're not going to um, run into any fundamental limits and things like frames may not be necessary in the long term in any case. So uh, to answer my question, how cheap can solar photovoltaics become? So I like the uh, descriptor by Ramus Nam, insanely cheap. So we've already got at least one more halving in cost in sight over the next three years and maybe another one after that, insanely cheap. 
the uptake of PERC, I'm very proud to say, as, as the inventor of it, has accelerated this uh, pace of change. And um, if you just uh, extend this generalized Moore's law plot uh, over the next few years, you'll see that we're going to hit 10 cents a watt, you know, sometime around 2023. So thanks very much for your attention. It's uh, been a pleasure preparing and giving this presentation.